Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast, a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Before we get on with uh, Maya Thompson uh, from the University of Iowa and talking about Cracking the Clinical Case, Part 1, uh, where she's going to give you five really great recommendations on getting prepared to succeed at these clinical cases, I'm going to play a five-minute clip of a book that I produced uh, with Eric Christensen from MedEd 101. And... Eric Christensen is the guy that creates the materials to help you with BCPS, uh, with BCACP. He's also expanded to, but also BCGP and the BCMTMS, the Board Certification Medication Therapy Management Specialist Care. So he knows what he's talking about with test prep and all that stuff. But for APPEs especially, and even residency, uh, getting enough clinical cases under your belt is the key. And uh, we've put together two books. I'm going to give you the five minute sample of pharmacotherapy, clinical pharmacy pearls, case studies, and common sense uh, for the first one. And then with the next episode, I'll give you a five minute briefing of the other one. And this is Mike Lenz's voice. Uh, Mike Lenz is a narrator that's also a pharmacist. So uh, Myself, uh, who's written 30 books, and Eric Christensen, who is an expert with the board certification, and Mike Lentz, who is a voice actor from Pharmacist and actually mayor of his town uh, at one point, uh, all came together uh, to put this together for you. So you can click on the link in the podcast notes, or you can go to uh, audible.com and pick it up. Uh, Now, the way that it works if you've never been on Audible before, uh, they will give you your first one for free. You just want to click on the link, uh, and uh, that's kind of a 30-day thing. And if you want to continue, you just continue. If you want to cancel, you can. But most people can listen to this about six or seven hours worth uh, on the way to and on the way back from their APPEs or residency. So here we go. Chapter 1, Case Studies. All right, let's take a look at some gastrointestinal case studies. We'll look at magnesium in chronic kidney disease. So let's say a 78-year-old male receives chronic opioid therapy for back pain and acetaminophen PM, brand Tylenol PM, one tablet at bedtime for sleep. Now, this gentleman struggled with constipation, taking docusate sodium, brand Colace, 100 milligrams daily for prevention. Eh, He needed more help. He started magnesium hydroxide, brand Milk of Magnesia, 30 mLs daily to relieve constipation, for weeks with excellent benefit. However, with a creatinine clearance around 25 mLs per minute, this patient was fortunate to have routine labs, including magnesium. You see, creatinine clearance measures how much creatinine, a waste product, the kidneys filter each minute. Now, for a healthy male this old, Normal creatinine clearance is about 75 mLs per minute. While he was asymptomatic, his magnesium showed 2.5 milliequivalents per liter, well above the normal range of 1.2 to 1.9, depending on the lab. Now, the important thing to remember is that magnesium can amass in chronic kidney disease, so we should educate our patients as magnesium in chronic kidney disease can cause negative side effects in these patients. All right, so now let's go over a few questions before we continue. Number one, when faced with a kidney disease patient taking magnesium, we're concerned about too much or too little magnesium. The answer is too much. And second, is a 78-year-old male's creatinine clearance of 25 mLs per minute high or low? The answer is this is very low, and it's indicative of kidney impairment. Let's move on to musculoskeletal case studies, NSAIDs, and GI bleeding. In this case, a patient struggled with gout symptoms, a condition of elevated uric acid levels. He took allopurinol, brand Xyloprim, 300 mg daily for hyperuricemia. His gout would flare periodically, and he'd endured three flare-ups in the past year. Indomethacin, Brand Indocin, 50 mg three times daily for up to a week's duration, provided relief. Now, due to continuing gout flares and different medicine trials for gout, the prescriber wrote an indomethacin order as needed, without limiting the length of use. Indomethacin regularly causes GI bleeding, but it's still a hallmark drug for symptomatic gout flare treatment. 
Often, if patients need chronic NSAID therapy like indomethacin, prescribers provide GI protection, such as a proton pump inhibitor like omeprazole or an H2 blocker like famotidine. Now, this patient lacked GI protection. So within a couple weeks of beginning consistent indomethacin use, the elderly gentleman found himself hospitalized, secondary to significant GI distress. He had black tarry stools, suggesting an NSAID-induced ulcer. Helicobacter pylori, a bacteria, can also cause ulcers. For these ulcers, we add antibiotics, usually in what is called quadruple therapy. This regimen consists of bismuth, metronidazole, tetracycline, and a PPI. So let's look at a couple of questions. When giving indomethacin regularly to a patient, we should assess GI status and or verify the patient has GI protection as is offered through which two drug classes? The answer is a proton pump inhibitor or H2 blocker. And next, if the patient had an H. pylori-induced ulcer, what drug regimen would be indicated? Now, remembering the mnemonic, BTOM, can be helpful here. This regimen would consist of bismuth, tetracycline, omeprazole, the PPI, and metronidazole. All right, so now let's take a look at NSAID's drug-induced hypertension. In this case, this 76-year-old patient had six blood pressure medicines. Lozartan, terazosin, clonidine, metoprolol, amlodipine, and hydrochlorothiazide. The clonidine was a recent addition, but still had minimal success. His systolic BPs consistently ran around 160 with this aggressive treatment. Here's the interview with Mia Thompson of the University of Iowa, just uh, our first of two episodes on cracking the clinical case. Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast. Remember the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Maya Thompson is back with us, and we're going to be talking about residency patient cases. Uh, the first section is going to be five tips to get ready for the case and start getting really good at them. And welcome to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast. Hi, thanks for having me again. I'm really excited to go through these cases and maybe my tips to help you guys kind of solve them. Okay, so let's just get right into it. Uh, what's the first thing we really need to do when we're talking about patient cases? And really, I want to say, I don't want to say impressing our preceptors, but at least showing that you're competent in the way that you're going to uh, not only research, but present the case. Uh, again, you're in an elective rotation for your first appy, but we're still kind of working on what are the clinical things we're going to do for your next appy. So what's your very first tip? Yeah, so my first tip would be, so to speak, planning ahead. So this is going to be what residency track are you more headed towards? Is it ambulatory? Is it acute care? And we're going to want to focus on what topics you might see in each of those settings. And so ambulatory care, I usually think of like anticoagulation or maybe diabetes management. And acute care focusing on what kind of disease states you see in acute care setting. Um, it might be, you know, heart failure. It could be, um, you know, infections like UTI or maybe even pneumonia. Just kind of differentiating between the two and which tracks or the cases you might see in those tracks. Okay, so when it comes to kind of preparing for residency and the interview that you're going to have in residency with that clinical case, let me just first kind of go over the, the interview itself. Most that are applying think that, okay, there's an interview and that's what I'm graded on, but there's actually three parts to the interview. There's the quotation fingers interview interview where you're getting to know them, they get to know you, see if it's a good fit. But then there's a case presentation and then there's also cases that they're going to give you to solve. And the one that we're really focusing on right now are the, the cases to solve. So kind of your first mindset is, Okay, well, if we're going to go into ambulatory care, let's make sure that we're focusing on those. If we're going into acute care, uh, let's focus on those. Uh, what is it, though, that, that makes your uh, presentation of the case and uh, breakdown of the case really stand out? Because uh, you don't just want to you know, survive the appy. You want to stand out in the appy and do really well. Uh, what would be your next tip? 
So my next tip might be your actual study strategy, and I know we kind of talked about that a little bit maybe last episode, but that's really tailored to how you study. So I know during my first cycle here, um, I've been studying a couple of topics for my next uh, rotation, but also I've made sure to do some cases that I might see in my acute care residency interview. Um, so those topics are just pertinent pertinent to your residency track, and your review process is tailored to you and specific to how you usually study. I usually have to do memorization or constantly going over things to just refresh myself, so that's kind of um, what I usually do. But you talked a little bit about when you study how do you keep that in your head? I know that a lot of people are studying for the NAPLEX right now and kind of at the end of their studying. And the frustration is that there are so many chapters, so many things to learn, but you have a way of kind of keeping it there so you can keep using it throughout various appies. Uh, what is it in your study strategy that helps you retain the, the information and make it readily accessible? Yeah, so I've created these notes just based on the topics in the NAPLEX prep book. Um, And so this note sheet is just a brief general overview of the disease state or the topic, so to speak. And I put it, I wrote it down in all these different colors on a sheet of paper. And so I actually have it in a three ring binder so I can go back and look at that note sheet. And then any either equations that I might need or specific medications. I have different note cards that I usually write on. And so just having a tangible thing that I can go back and look to um, is something that I do for review. Okay, let's move on to part three. What's your next best tip? So my next best tip is just kind of thinking outside of the box. So with this patient case, you know, they are assessing your clinical knowledge, but they're also assessing your problem-solving skills and how to use your resources. So they might tell you, okay, you can use any resources you like, or they might give you specific resources that they would like you to use. So just being comfortable in any resources that you usually like or, you know, kind of thinking, okay, I might get thrown something that's totally wild, How will I handle that? What will be my problem-solving skills? Okay, so can you tell me what you guys use at Iowa in terms of specific resources when you're looking up um, ambulatory or acute care cases, and is there a difference? Yeah, so, I mean, we like to use Micromedx or maybe even UpToDate just as more of a website information. We don't use too many, I guess, like handheld resources anymore, more so there's not really any books um, that we usually use. Um, but it's more so those web-based uh, resources. And so you might have to practice your skills on where to find that. Um, we have LexiComp, which is more for like the drugs, and then up-to-date usually using like disease states and what you can search. There is one thing we should kind of talk about before we get on to the fourth one, which is when you're in your app, you, you have lots of time. And when you're in that clinical case, you're actually going to be timed maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Uh, What's maybe a way that you can kind of get to the heart of the matter first? Uh, I know when you you kind of talk about sharpening the saw or the axe or whatever it is to chop down a tree, Lincoln said something like, I'd spend two hours sharpening and then one hour doing it. What is it that you can do to make sure, I guess, that you 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 you're being mindful of the time that you're going to have to prepare the case. Yeah, so I would say just maybe going to the pertinent information in that case and what is necessary that you need to solve the the chief complaint, what they're really asking you right out of the gate, and once you get that down you can kind of start going back and looking, okay, what other problems will I be needing to solve? And being um fluent in those resources that you're using is going to be really helpful so you can find where that information is quickly and so you can kind of already have a process in mind. Okay, I need to go here to find this fact that I need. I need to go here to, you know, maybe find these details and just kind of having a step-by-step process. So a lot of the time it's you kind of know what it is, but then you have to go make sure. Is that that right? Exactly, yeah. So you should have a general knowledge going in, but maybe, okay, I don't know this specific dose of this medication I want to add on. Let me quick go to Micromedx, look up the dosing. And so you have a general already idea, and so using that with your clinical knowledge, but then going to these resources and maybe refining that search. 
Okay. So your next tip, you talked a little bit about going back to basics, uh, although we're going to be talking about advanced cases in, our, in the next episode. Tell me a little bit about what you mean by that. Yeah. So in presenting your results, you might have either written or even oral communication. Um, so you got to practice those skills. You have to make sure, okay, when I'm talking to my, my interview panel or I'm talking to these pharmacists, they clearly understand what I am talking about. And so you might have written, so it can be in soap note format, which we use at Iowa, or you can do, um, you know, like just basic presentation skills counting down, okay, these are my steps, these were my problem-solving skills that I had, um, just making sure that it is clear and concise, not necessarily, you know, okay, you found all this great information, but you have to also be able to portray it in a really good way. Okay, so you're kind of talking about telling the story of the patient, the subjective, the objective, the assessment and plan. I see a lot of times that students are trying to be clever when they uh, put in their PowerPoints as part of their presentation that when they, they do kind of one of those about me things, uh, they'll put in subjective and they'll talk a little bit about them themselves and then the objective assessment and plan. But tell me a little bit about what that really means with the patient case and how you've been prepared at Iowa uh, to present something like that. Uh, do you guys do that digitally where you just kind of write down the soap or how does this, the soap note actually work uh, when, you're, when you're talking about practice and those practices that you've had at, at school? Yeah, so we've either had soap notes where we've written, so we might be doing a performance-based assessment where you just have a piece of paper, and you. I like to write things out, and so I would have a scratch sheet, and I would write like my SOAP, and I'd write all the information that is necessary, my subject and my objective, things like that. And so I would write it out um, and then present it because I find it easier to write things out and have my thoughts on paper, whereas you can do a typed out soap note. It just honestly is your preference. And so in the residency interview, they might tell you, okay, we have paper for you. Um, They might not. And so that's kind of just something that you need to be prepared for and fluent in both. Yeah, I I know the data show that if you write something down, your retention is going to be much higher. And then for whatever reason, the physical act of doing it also helps kind of keep it in your brain. So as you're doing those you find that, oh, I'm, I'm kind of remembering uh, this case that I had before and because I, I put it pen to paper uh, and that, that kinesthetic component kind of keeps it in there. Well, let's go on to your, your fifth recommendation. Yeah, and so we've kind of practiced all of our skills, our study strategy, um, back to our basics with our oral and written um, skills, but now we're actually practicing those cases. And so those cases you picked out based on the topics of what track you're going on, we're going to be practicing them. So I know there's books that you can buy that have multiple patient cases in them. Um, You can also maybe go back to your lecture notes or what you did maybe, I know we did in lab, um, and kind of going through those assessments. Uh, Just a reminder though, what you covered in lecture, what you covered in lab might be super narrow of a topic and these patient cases might be pretty broad and covering multiple topics at a time. But as long as you're practicing, you're getting comfortable with the amount of information, I guess, being thrown at you, that's going to be a key part uh, to your timed, I guess, patient case. And tell me a little bit about, uh, you, you've actually had work, hospital work experience. Uh, a lot of what you do is uh, kind of like uh, medication history and those types of things. Tell me a little bit about the requirements that the ho- are the requirements that the hospital has any different than what you're taught in class? I know it's University of Iowa hospitals and clinics, and you're going to the University of Iowa. But is there any difference between what you're learning in school and, and what you're at that hospital? And then maybe do you think that uh, future hospitals might be a little bit different? I wouldn't say there's exactly too much of a different with the process. However. There are specific things that you just need to look at if you're doing a medication history. And you just kind of have to be fluent when you're talking to these patients and recognizing the patient population. And really, as I've had more time at my position at UIHC, um, I've really been able to kind of refine and know what questions I need to ask a patient in order to get that medication history correct. 
that might change. The medication history process may change in the future. It all just kind of depends on where we're going pharmacy-wise. All right. Well, thanks again for listening to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast. We will have part two of Cracking the Clinical Case. Uh, We'll go over a couple of uh, cases and uh, really kind of narrow down uh, exactly how we want to do this. I know the uh, curse of knowledge happens on the preceptor side where uh, they kind of forget that the last Appy student was a, a July student who had been through many, many patient cases. And then all of a sudden, uh, well, I'm sorry, they're, they're, they would have been an April student, right? Because you started in May? Yes, right? I started yeah, in May. Yeah, so graduating students uh, that had had, you know, months and months of training. And then all of a sudden, here are the new, uh, new P4s uh, that are coming in and kind of starting uh, again from scratch. But again, you may feel a little bit of imposter syndrome, and I'm talking to the, the audience out there, and, and that is completely normal. And the fact of the matter is that those residents that you're going to be with soon uh, will start feeling a little bit of that. So what happens is, because there's a little bit of a difference, uh, you guys are starting in May and June, and then the residents are kind of starting end of June, beginning of July, you're seeing residents at their very best. They've almost had a full year, and you're kind of uh, in the position where you're at the very beginning. And so what we want to do is make sure that uh, you're as competent as possible as soon as you get into the appy. So thanks, Maya, for your help on this one, and then we'll uh, see you again in part two. So again, if you want to check out the book, Pharmacotherapy, Clinical Pharmacy Pearls, Case Studies, and Common Sense, uh, you can just click on uh, the show notes and it will take you right to Audible. Uh, and I, I think audiobooks are really the way to go to fit in when you're just so busy. Need help from me? Tony the Pharmacist at gmail.com or residency.teachable.com.